Hello and welcome to Thanatology Themes. I'm your host, Carolyn, therapist and thanatologist. I am thrilled today. Um, we have a great speaker slash uh, guest, Ruth ha Habush, Habush, Habush. Um, yes. I'm mispronouncing her name because I have known her since third grade and that's her married name. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting that we both, we grew up together and we both entered the field of mental health. Um, so I'm going to just a uh, little intro here about Ruth. She is an LMHC. She is a therapist and program supervisor in a community mental health setting. Uh, she works with adults with many diagnoses of anxiety, depression, mood disorders, addiction, and PTSD. She is trained in EMDR, CBT, attachment theory, and person-centered theory. Um, so I'm excited to have her here today because she really works a lot with trauma, and I think she trains her, her uh, clinicians. And I, as everybody knows, specialize in grief, but there's this intersection of grief and trauma, which we're going to really talk about today, and she's going to help us. Um, before we jump in with Ruth, we're going to check in with our Thanatology theme. Here's our handbook, my, my book that I love so much. Um, and I'm going to read the de definition of traumatic bereavement. Again, there's trauma, bereavement, and this is an intersection. So just a brief um, uh, definition, okay? Historically, clinicians and researchers were divided in, your, in opinion regarding the interface between trauma and bereavement. So we'll see if Ruth and I are in that group or um, there were others who really considered them uh, as separate entities, okay? As the name implies, traumatic bereavement involves the experience of both trauma and bereavement connected to the experience of loss. And I do wanna add, and I know we're gonna talk about this, um, in the handbook of Thanatology, the definition is very specific to um, natural disasters or mass tragedies. And I know that we're going to talk about other times people feel trauma. Um, Ruth might touch a little bit on the DSM diagnosis, but what trauma really means, right? So, um, okay. So, so let's jump in. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about symptoms, but did anything come up when I was talking? Did any, were you thinking of anything, Ruth? Well, I, I love that definition that you just read and, and kind of this this idea of where does trauma and bereavement fit in and when they like intersect each other. Um, and so I'm actually really excited to to talk about this with you and kind of see where we are in, in terms of that. So good. So let's start with the basics. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you I know you were going to go through um, maybe symptoms that you that you see or maybe what you look for when um, a client first comes to you? Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of when I'm working with a client who has experienced trauma and usually by the time they're meeting with me, they may be, what I'm looking for is, is this meeting criteria for PTSD? And what, what symptoms we may see um, in somebody who's experiencing this are, um, there's really a whole list of them. Um, things like intrusion symptoms where they're having flashbacks, nightmares, um, you know, these reminders of the trauma. There's avoidance behaviors where um, they're either avoiding memories or thinking about the trauma or even avoiding people, places, and activities related to it. Uh, they can experience these really pervasive negative changes in their mood and thoughts, including like um, really persistent negative beliefs about themselves, about others, about the world where, you know, before the trauma occurred, they knew life in one way. And after they don't know whether to trust people. They may, you know, come to think that people are all people are untrustworthy, or that the world is an unsafe place. Um, they can have, they can experience, you know, distorted cognitions about even the cause of the trauma, some consequences, you know, in ways to kind of 
the ways that they kind of um, make up the story to explain, right, what's happened in some way. Um, they can have these reactivity um, symptoms where they they can become, you know, very reckless in behavior. They can have angry outbursts. Um, hypervigilance is a really uh, common symptom that I see of this like constant scanning of the environment you know after experiencing something where your world is deemed unsafe there needs to you know a lot of times um clients are are just on really high alert about what's the next danger that might be coming their way um so you know exaggerated startle response is something else um and, and again like uh, sleep disturbances and difficulty concentrating. So as you can see, there's a whole list of of um, symptoms that could that someone could be experiencing. And when we think about whether somebody would you know meet criteria for PTSD, even to meet criteria, they have to be demonstrating at least six of these different symptoms. So to imagine what, somebody's internal world is like going through, you know, all of these symptoms that kind of gives sort of this snapshot of, of, of what that might be like in terms of symptoms. It's yeah. Thank you. And what's really interesting, the last interview I did for all of our, um, our watch, our listeners and watchers out there was with Jillian Bluford, a PhD at University of Denver about prolonged grief disorder. We did not go through the symptoms. We were focused on cultural assessment. A number of the things you just said are things we do see in, in prolonged grief disorder, especially the first two and some of the later things are very much connected to um, when, when people, when their grief has really turned into something it's I'm I'm really hearing the intersection of these symptoms that you mentioned from PTSD with grief. Of course, not not all grievers, very few, but I I really heard it. So that's interesting. Where I'm already seeing kind of this intersection here of some of these things: the avoidance, the hypervigilance, um, sleep disturbance, and I can't remember the first two you said, but where I was like, oh my god, oh my god, um, whatever those were. So it's already. I just want to also say one thing is that I think as a clinician, I don't know if you struggle with this, but I'll hear these things and I'm like, they have three or they have four, but they don't have all six. So they don't meet the DSM, but then it's like, which tools or which mode they still have these symptoms and I still want to help them. Um, I I'm going a little off track here, but I don't anything about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying that there is this, you know, of course, we we want to be responsible in terms of diagnosis, right? And it's not just about throwing a diagnosis when it's not really fully met. But I, I wonder if if when you're in those situations where maybe they don't fully meet the criteria of PTSD, there may be something else going on. And it's kind of about being able to explore, well, maybe there's, you know, I, I, maybe maybe there's the prolonged bereavement or what you know some other um, mm -hmm. a more appropriate diagnosis, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't address the symptoms that that they're experiencing, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, so thank you. So let's move into treatment. I know you were maybe going to talk about. Um, CBT attachment. Um, I definitely want it. You said somatic, which is something I do a lot of. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one would you like to start with? Yeah. Um, I, I guess the kind of in terms of I, I, CBT is really my, my general, like next, typically an initial step in treatment when I'm working with clients um, who have trauma and PTSD is really focusing on safety. Like it is about safety, 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 not only physical safety, um, but their internal safety. And, you know, just really everything is centered around their safety. In fact, um, you know, in the, the setting where I work, I'm aware that, you know, many of the clients that come have experienced trauma and it's really important. This is something I, as a trauma informed therapist need to keep in mind that like, 
even something as far as, as, as little as how they feel walking into the front desk and in, into the waiting area and their interactions with the front desk staff. Like that needs to be just really kept in mind as we remember all these symptoms that, that somebody may be going through is this one place where they're coming to um, receive treatment for, for, for this is, should be, you know, fully safe for them, right? In, in all these different ways. So safety is, is really the number one thing. And, and um, I, I really focus on strengthening client autonomy and empowerment because what's happened a lot of times after trauma is, is somebody's sense of powers about, you know, this, this trauma has happened that they didn't have control over. They didn't, um, this thing happened to them. And so sometimes there can be this real loss of, uh, of power about and, and kind of wanting to work on um, just strengthening that with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as where CBT comes in is, you know, as I went through some of the symptoms, you know, one of them is that there can be, uh, um, you know, distorted thoughts that kind of happen as a result of the trauma. And so when, when, and that's a real nuanced um, thing. I, I, I take a nuanced approach to that because um, I, I know that in the therapy world, CBT can sometimes like get some slack where it's like, you know, um, are you trying to gaslight somebody, <laughs> you know, where, where you're sitting looking at these thoughts and saying, no, this isn't actually accurate. Um, but, but truthfully, when working with somebody with um, trauma, I, have to make sure that when we are addressing some of those distorted cognitions, that they are in a place where they are regulated and grounded and ready to kind of look at some of those. Because if they're not, if if they are in a um, in a triggering state, right? They may be um, to hear someone else tell them, "Oh, well, you know, that thought doesn't make sense," or to kind of um, really challenge that could feel like um, a threat to their safety emotionally. So, so that's kind of my nuanced look on CBT, mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, you say, you say so many important things and it's interesting to me too, because I was doing a training and, and, you know, I was trained as a hospice social worker and a lot of our training is validation, validation, and maybe even yours. And recently I'm like, I'm not going to validate maladaptive coping or maladaptive thoughts, you know, like that's actually not helpful to the person, but I hear what you're saying. We have to be really careful about how we do it. Right. Yeah. But even to that, um, sometimes it's really important with, with trauma. One of the ways that I, you know, when that we can do this um, validating these maladaptive uh, thoughts is when when clients will talk about what they did to survive the trauma and i can validate that that was so important that thought or that action or that thing that you did then was so important because it kept you alive and and even though right now maybe it's not helpful to you it was you know a a, a um a life-saving thought or action you know certainly sir absolutely and and you know, you do a different kind. I'm I'm moving my mic closer so everyone can see. Um, and you do a different kind of trauma. But I, you're right. If I'm working with someone, especially from, and I've said this to some people, um, you know, a lot of times people come to therapy for me. Yours is different, but it'll be the things that you were doing as a kid or a teenager for so long worked then. Now they're not working any longer, mm -hmm. right? Like you said, they had to do those at that time, and now you're. 25, 30, whatever, and, and they're not working. Right. Right. Um, so, so to your point, yeah, that's, you know, that's a really great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, right. go ahead. Yeah. I'd love to hear, I, I know that you do a lot of work with somatic, somatic work, and I'd love to hear kind of how you do that in, in terms of this work. What, so I do a couple things, you know, I, I, added in with the shadow work. So if someone's having a particular 
anxiety, let's say, will well, I'll have them close their eyes and I have them go imagine themselves in the um, situation, you know, what were you wearing? What was happening? And then we'll imagine the feelings and emotions and they'll name those. And then we go into their body. Where did you feel it in your body? Was it shortness of breath or tight shoulders or this? And then we do an exercise where they visualize pushing it out in front of them and imagining this other version of themselves holding the anxiety or the, we'll name it sometimes the anxious part or the anxious Ruth will hold the mm -hmm. anxiety for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's so great. And that's, um, that's, I mean, that's another type of thing that can be so helpful in working with trauma too, because a lot of times part of the survival to deal with and cope with trauma has been to ignore the body and just stay out of the body, right? And so um, a lot of that awareness that I, you know, even asking clients, where, what are you feeling and where are you feeling it is kind of a way to like bring them to the present moment right now in their body and to be able to, instead of um, kind of staying in the past and, and thinking about, you know, these past traumatic events, right? But it's a way to kind of keep them in the, in the present. Yeah. And I'm behind me somewhere is the body keeps the score. Um, mm. I, is that light blue one? Is <laughs> this one right here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, a friend of mine's in graduate school and kept talking about Van der Kolk. Van, I guess I always knew him as Bessel. I'm like, who is this band? And I'm like, oh, I've had that book for 50 years or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's, a, you know, like Van der Kolk. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, but I agree. I think it is really, really important. So we, I try to put a, add a little bit of that in. Um, and then I've also just recently learned somatic pendulation. Um, I did a workshop for grief, but it was with a somatic a therapist who really specializes more in somatics than grief, but this was bringing them together. And I learned how to do a somatic pendulation. Have you? Hmm. No, I haven't heard of that. It's where you, so you'll, you identify what we were saying, identify where in, in your body you feel the um, trauma or anxiety. So let's say it's your heart. So I'll say, put your right hand where you feel the, um, the you know, trauma, anxiety, or, you know, grief, and then identify a part of your body where you feel grounded. It could be, it can be your elbow. It could be your, you know, it can be, and then you take your left hand and it can be your nose, whatever. And then you have them close their eyes and you take a breath and you kind of feel the trauma, feel the, you know, sometimes people will say their legs, their legs feel grounded or their, you know, stomach or people actually come up with really good. I'm not coming up with any good ones right now. People actually, <laughs> but then they'll pendulate between the, the trauma, anxiety, or, and then the calm, the true, and it's supposed to help you smooth it out or mm -hmm. help you kind of come to a place of balance, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I've just started doing a little of that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I didn't know. I I didn't. I hadn't heard that term, but I was aware of that kind of practice of of really connecting to this other grounded part of your body. And and again, that just empowers somebody to feel safety, right? To be able to look to themselves to find this way when they're feeling dysregulated. To look to some other part of themselves to to really um, gain more autonomy over their emotional safety. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk, well, let's jump into, let's jump into EMDR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's. So you're, so you're trained and you, you teach other clinicians EMDR. No, I don't, I don't teach other cl clinicians about EMDR, but I've been trained. Yes. Um, well, will you speak a little bit about it? Yeah, so I, in terms of, I know that EMDR is, you know, in the therapy world, people have lots of strong opinions. Some are really positive, some are negative, right? Um, I am not, I look at EMDR as one tool in my toolbox of, of what to use um, because I really recognize and honor each client's individual needs. And 
you know, there uh, in trauma treatment, it, there is no one size fits all. And it's about doing what works with each client, right? Um, and the truth is there are some clients that if I were to ask them to close their eyes and, um, you know, tap their shoulders and just let whatever comes up, come up, they would be like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> this doesn't feel comfortable to me. I don't want to do that. Right. So, so it's about finding what's, um, what works for each client and, and in the, the particular work that I'm doing, um, the other important aspect of, of EMDR work is looking at somebody's level of stability and functioning outside of, um, outside of session, right? So, because doing really deep trauma work is difficult and challenging and not all clients that I'm working with anyway, have the luxury to take two days of work off because and and be surrounded by all of these resources to um, you know help them recover from from this deep work, right? So I found at least for for the clients that I'm working with now, the the type of EMDR that I like to really use is more of an attachment focused EMDR, which is um, really using it in a way to increase my client's internal resources. So for instance, I will use it to talk to clients about, you know, let's come up with a safe place. And it's this is a safe place in your mind. So that these are things they can access internally, regardless of where they are. They could be on the train, um, you know, having experiencing a um, flashback and then doing this work where they can create this safe place in their mind it's something that they can utilize and then go to to um you know provide some grounding we can we talk about creating a a comforting figure a protective figure and these can all be real or they can be you know a a movie star it can be somebody who actually they don't know or it could be completely made up but it's whatever the client you know whatever resonates with the client yeah yeah um i know that's wonderful thank you um i wanted to add that i know people who have had great success a uh, clients who've mm -hmm. had great success with emdr um so these, so this is my person, my my experience, not perception. But so, so these clients had direct trauma happen to them. Mm -hmm. um, what I've found in my clients who are grieving, who had a family member die in a very traumatic way, but they didn't witness it. So they read a forensics port report. A police officer or some, you know, uniformed person gave them, you know, these like really mm -hmm. terrible, you know, terrible situations. Um, they get the information, but they didn't witness this, tr the tra trauma. So a part of it is they're getting it secondhand or they're filling in the blanks. Those clients have informed me it hasn't been successful for them. Um, mm -hmm. EMDR hasn't been successful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any, um, you know, comment thoughts between witnessing it directly versus these other folks who, I mean, it's when they're relaying it to me, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, they're, they're violent deaths, you know, mm -hmm. but the person didn't see it. Mm -hmm. right? No, that makes a lot of sense to me because EMDR work is about, um, identifying these target memories, right? So a lot of times people with trauma have these, these memories that can come up in their mind. Like, it's almost like imagine a, you know, a snapshot, a, um, a photograph, but it's in this time, but it's not just two dimensional, it's their thoughts, their feelings, their body sensation. It just immediately can come up, right? And so what you're telling me is the, the clients that that's not working so well with is because maybe they didn't have that that snapshot time where the the level of distress happened throughout their body, right? Like maybe reading through it. Yes, there are 
um, you know, of course, thoughts and feelings going um, to kind of work through <laughs> with that. But um, oh. new, I'm sorry, Ruth, but we have a new guest who is far more uh, expert than you are. Yeah, um, this is Gerwin the cat. Oh, um, <laughs> um, to make an appearance. Um, no, but I'm sorry, but what you're saying is really important here. Um, mm -hmm. No, I want to go back to this. So, please yeah. continue. Yeah. So I was just saying it makes sense what you were saying about clients that you're seeing that it's not working well because they may not have that that moment, that snapshot in time that keeps coming up for them over and over again that is this target memory that emdr uses to work with yeah. i don't know is that kind of what i think so i think there must be something very true in that you know and i i thought it had something to do well i wasn't sure about because i know sometimes emdr has to do with like this visual and they don't that they have something in their mind but they you know, kind of, I don't want to say made it up, but it they had to envision it, right? They mm -hmm. didn't see this violent act that happened. So they, and they they also, I mean, they know some details, but they also don't really know all the details. So mm -hmm. the, it's, yeah, so, so thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. Because I think that's, it's really important and really helpful as we're kind of talking about trauma and grief. Um, even some therapists who I know are very, um, caring and want to help people sometimes do I think people love EMDR and CBT I think everyone's like EMDR CBT we all need it which I'm like it is helpful and I think you're really helping us um and I do say CBT and EMDR are not grief modalities they're mm -hmm. not they're very helpful for trauma or for certain things but I think this conversation we're also separating out grief and trauma right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to say my training is that you have to treat the trauma first and then the grief. So these things are really helpful, what you're saying, but I just want people to know in clinicians. Um, and I think I had mentioned to you last year, I had two or three clients in a row who came to me for grief. Um, and they said, you know, um, my last th therapist gave me all these CBT paper, form what are they called? Um, uh, or <laughs> and I didn't think it was that helpful, which I, again, I do think CBT is helpful, but for these particular grievers, I don't think that it met the intersection. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, I completely agree. I, I, I as far as I would understand meeting the, working with the trauma first is important because it establishes the safety. It again, it goes back to the safety, right? That um, in order to, it, it's really difficult to process these um, emotions of loss and and all that comes up in in grieving when you literally don't feel safe in your own body, right? <laughs> right. So I can understand kind of establishing some baseline of safety is important first. Um, in addressing the trauma. And then when, you know, again, always taking the client's lead and establishing their um, autonomy and, and um, empowerment in this, then when they feel ready to kind of work through the, the grief and kind of um, do that work that, that we go with them in that. Um, but again, I, when you bring up, <laughs> CBT worksheets. Um, that's I'm I'm never a fan, uh, just personally. So, um, but I can imagine that just really how difficult it would be for a client who is, uh, you know, grieving and to kind of just just for me personally to be told kind of read through this this. Uh, this worksheet and kind of work your way out of it doesn't doesn't feel very I don't know comfortable for me but again like I said you know all clients are different and maybe there are some clients that really do appreciate that but that's why it's important to find the therapist that that you click with right so that is true absolutely it's interesting though because i'm remembering i had worked with a client who ended up developing developing really severe anxiety um which i think 
had been it was it was this it was a tr it was a, a violent death and then went right into covid and then this person was very isolated and i think it was a, a number of things and i think the client this client actually had grieved and the cbt was helpful because at that point we were really doing more um symptom management or coping skills or mm -hmm. you know like it was more like um they were going in you know out in public kind of like getting um feeling really anxious out in the world so i think it really wasn't as connected to the grief it had really manifested into this like anxiety out in the world mm -hmm. um, so in that case cbt was more helpful um mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. You know, I think it is interesting. It's hard as a clinician to sometimes um, uh, parse it out, right? Right, right, definitely. And I think in, in terms of treatment, I think one more thing I just think is important to um, mention is just how important psychoeducation is in trauma treatment as well, because so much of the experience of these symptoms is confusion and disorientation and not knowing what's going on in your body, right? Like why these thoughts and feelings keep coming up or occurring. And so that's another really big piece of this is, is really teaching clients that this is happening. It's, it's it kind of twofold because it's one, you know, there's a sense of relief or comfort that comes to having a name, like to name something, right? And then also knowing that it reminds the client that they're not alone in this too, that this is, this is, there are other people who are experiencing this as well, not to diminish, you know, what they're going through, but I think it, it can be really a helpful piece to this. I couldn't agree more. I also believe from my work in hospice, we did a lot of psychoeducation. I mean, you know, in the dying process, we don't fix anything, right? But we're there at, to, we give a lot of psychoeducation. And going back to what you were saying about safety, I think that it helps the person feel secure that you know this, right? Mm -hmm. You are creating the safe space. Oh, I'm here with this person who has seen this before or knows this or names it. And I feel like that, I don't know, makes a container or safety mm -hmm. or security, or there's something there when, um, you know, I know we're, when we were in hospice, sometimes they would say like, I'm just glad you're here. And I'm like, okay, I'm fine to be here. You know, your loved one's still going to die. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, there's something we're giving them that psychoeducation. It just seems to me goes back to this idea of you, you know, we're, we're giving them safety or an anchoring. Is me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is another piece, sorry, that is, is that we share in the grief and the trauma world is our presence, our grounded presence with the client, because that is so important in what I see in my work is um, I may be one of the very few people that they come in contact with in the week that can sit with them in, in their thoughts and feelings as they're coming up in their distress and kind of, and so that's why it's, I, I really, um, really focus on when, when I have my clients that are coming up, you know, that I know are, are um, experiencing PTSD, I do the work beforehand to get myself in that grounded space because it is so important with them as well. So I, that, that seems to be a, a shared, um, you know, importance in, in both grief and trauma. I think so. And um, I actually, with all my clients, I say, can we take a breath together? And I take them through like a little mini, mini um, relaxation. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, 60 seconds of a relaxation and then we take a breath together. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'll say to them, you can say no, we don't have to, mm -hmm. but do you want to start by taking a breath together? Um, you know, and usually people will say yes. So like you said, we're both doing it. And then I try to attune with the client. Um, you know, Carl Jung did a lot of that. He really was about how does the therapist attune with our clients. Um, and I had done a little workshop with that. So um, similar to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to bring up our exciting graphic, but did you want to say anything before that? 
Um, no, I don't think so. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to try something really exciting here. I'm going to screen share. And this is just going to be... Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Um, this is our... Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here we go. There it is. Um, so, you know, as everyone can see, we, you know, we have our circle of grief, um, which I do think people are somewhat familiar with. I do want to point to people at the very bottom here, um, disbelief, shock, numbness, and irritability. I don't know if people know those are all a part of grief. Just wanted to add that. Then we have our trauma circle and Ruth, you really touched on a lot of those um, symptoms and a lot of what, what you see. And then there's the circle where they come together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I just wanna briefly read over the traumatic grief. Um, Cause these were some of the points when you were talking, I, I kind of was nodding my head. Um, avoidance of certain um, places. So I did a training and they talked about this woman was avoiding um, her daughter, her child, a child had died, but was a teenager and would drive all the way out of the way to avoid the high school. They mm -hmm. live near the high school. So avoidance, mm -hmm. um, difficulty acknowledging the death. Um, I do hear about that, you know, um, detachment, shock, emptiness, um, anger, um, pur purposeless regarding the future, which I also think sometimes looks like depression. So I think that's hard sometimes for clinicians to grief, depression. Um, I pretty early on with my clients introduced post-traumatic growth. Um, that's been an appropriate way to work with prolonged grief and, and with all grievers. I don't what are your thoughts on that? I don't know if with trauma, that's really, is that appropriate? I I do, I think, and sometimes it is, um, I, I mean, definitely on an individual basis, but I have definitely um, worked with clients. And when I bring that up with them, they are, first of all, surprised and shocked to hear that there is such a thing as post-traumatic growth, because it they can be in a state feeling like there's there's no hope, right? I'm always going to be feeling this way. And so even just hearing that there is this thing called post-traumatic growth that that has been researched and have, has seen that this, this is uh, a possibility does provide so much hope for clients. So it's definitely really helpful in trauma work too. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting because you had mentioned avoidance and you had mentioned some of these. Oh, and the intrusive thoughts um, is something that um, I do have a number of my clients, especially ones who experienced a traumatic death. And so that was really interesting because even with those clients, like I said, EMDR wasn't helpful, but they'll still sometimes have um, intrusive thoughts. So it's two things. One, it's the people who have you know read the forensics. Um, I am working with the young person who had a parent um, die the person had been sick, but it was really young and this was really hard. And this was a young person taking care of a parent, which is really hard. Um, so has she has some intrusive thoughts? Um, I think it's different though. I think it's different than in the trauma that you're describing. Um, because yeah, what would the, what type of intrusive thought is the, is what you're seeing in terms of grief, like, um, um, and I'm trying to, I, you know, I don't want to do a HIPAA violation, right? So I'm trying oh, to, yeah, 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 no, no. Um, I think, so I will give an example that a lot that people have talked about. This is true. So sometimes when, if someone's on hospice for a while or, and again, there's often younger people 
30 and under taking care of a parent, which is, it's hard for a 50 year old, let alone, you know, a 25 year old. Um, if there's a lot of medical care that has to be done, if this young person is really doing care for the parent and really taking care of someone in this almost medic, you know, they're at home, they're on hospice. It's really hard emotionally, physically. Um, and to see someone decline is really difficult, especially if you're like 25 years old and this is a parent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's something in the, like the deterioration of watching a parent, someone who raised you, so, you know, security and safety, right? This is my secure, safe place. They're this it's, I'm using the word deteriorate right um, yeah. but it's maybe because it's over a time um people do still feel like it's trauma but i think it's very different than some of the trauma you're talking about which i feel like is more acute mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that chronic versus acute is that something yeah i i think that i mean trauma can be one instance you know one single instance or it could be this compounded um thing happening over time, right? Um, and so, but it sounds like, yeah, the way you're describing a client that's kind of going through this long process, I, I guess it would, in terms of a trauma lens, I would be wondering, as that person's going through that process, do they have the supports along the way? Because if they do, um, I don't know if if that would most likely result in these prolonged traumatic symptoms afterwards, right? Because a lot of times it's when when somebody experiences either a single thing or a a single thing for too long that's just at to you know it's trauma is about th the either actual or threatened death, right? Or this um, so. So I would wonder if if a, a client who's going through that has those supports to make sense of that and work through it for a prolonged period of time. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes perfect sense. And some of the people who are coming to me now, this was during COVID. And so there was a lot of limited support from medical care, hospice, home care. There was just a lot of limited support at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll see a change in that. But you nailed it, really. Um, you know, this limited support certainly mm -hmm. was, a big, was a big problem, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know where we are in time, but is I, I do have a, a sort of a a case to present and kind of how you would view this is do we have time? Is it... We do. We have about 10 minutes. So that's okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um one of the things I, I kind of would love to hear your thoughts on is I there there was a, a therapist once that wanted to refer a client to me because um they told me, you know, this client um, would be good to do trauma work. And as I was kind of taking the history, came to find out that this was a mother who in in the history had experienced um, a, a stillborn experience, a miscarriage, and had her living children taken away um, through, you know, by ACS or the child welfare system, right? So, which again, any one of those instances could definitely have result in this, these traumatic, you know, PTSD symptoms, right? But as I was hearing this, I'm, I just was, um, what to me, I didn't feel like I was the appropriate person in terms of trauma, because it sounded like a lot of loss, actually. Um, how, yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and and how you would go about, you know, kind of approaching somebody like that. Sure. I mean, the first thing, and so to me, I feel this is all grief to me. Um, and the first thing I would have done or I would do is um, so we have specific names for each of those losses, um, you know, 
losing your kids in the welfare system is an ambiguous loss. And I would have um, psychoeducation, right? Given this person the definition, what that means, how it came, you know, what, and people often really, like you were saying before, like the definition, like the structure. Um, the a stillborn is we call a tangible loss. Um, this is real, but it can also be kind of disenfranchised. Um, I mean, people will feel bad for you, but they might not, you know, you could feel it's like the loss of a parent and people, oh, I'm sad, you know, but it can feel the word we use sometimes is disenfranchised. Um, mm -hmm. And then what was the other? Uh, was a miscarriage. Oh, a miscarriage is even more disenfranchised, I think, than um, often, mm -hmm. you know, I, again, people might feel sad, but they don't really know. To you, this is a really real loss. And then the other one is the, is uh, tangible. So the first thing is psychoeducation, defining it. And when I define things, I also say like, I'll say, you know, this is the definition from a book, but what do you think? 99% of the time people are like, yeah, that's right. That's helpful. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for defining it. You know, this kind of thing. Um, then in my training, we ask the client or we help them identify which of the losses is, um, the least traumatic and we first actually go to the least traumatic and we process that loss first then you go to the harder one and then you go to the harder one um however in this case you know lose well you of course we want to work with people where they're at and you would work with the client to identify that i would imagine though you know if she's if this person's not seeing their their children that would be really hard right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would do it. Yeah. It's kind of yeah, I loved Yeah, I love that that idea of order and kind of when when you have so many different losses and being able to ask the client which one, you know, assessing kind of which one is is the the worst or, you know, most significant and kind of identifying that order. Um, but something really stood out to me in terms of you were mentioning this psychoeducation about the ambiguous loss in the welfare system, the child welfare system, because sadly, this is not even acknowledged as a loss sometimes. And, and I hear this over and over again with my clients that sometimes even when I, I may be the first person in their lives to acknowledge that this is a loss, because when, when someone is being, um, scrutinized by the child welfare system they are in this constant state of i need to you know be aware of my behavior i can't actually express the human feelings that i'm angry and upset and sad that you've you know that my children are with me right now um so so that that acknowledgement that it is a loss even is is not i feel like um in the child with within that system there it's really disenfranchised right because it's not often acknowledged sometimes because of shame they can't clients can't even share with family or friends what's happening so it really doesn't get get acknowledged um i mean you make a good point it's ambiguous and you're right it is disenfranchised i mean you're educating me i didn't yeah you're right though i'm sure it is also disenfranchised at the same time mm -hmm. so a lot of feelings around that um mm -hmm. you know and i hear yeah it's really important that you're the first person or the maybe the only person that's able to really like say that and give them that space mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. really hard yeah. Um, and I was just going to point out talking about ordering the losses. Um, so um, this is um, grief counseling and, and grief counseling and grief therapy. Um, you can, This book is from like 1991. Um, I just did an in-person workshop with William Warden. Um, mm -hmm. He is, he admittedly is 9,000 years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said, he's like, this might be it. This might be the last one, which it, it, it could be, but I got to meet him in person and he's kind of a legend in this field. Mm -hmm. um, so I just did a workshop with him last week and he was the one who talked about how to, you know, he, the, it was about multiple losses mm -hmm. and he talked about how we order it and how we um, do how, when we're working with someone. So the first loss we go through, not only do the one, I don't want to say easiest, but that they can process 
And then, you know, it's helped them. Okay. This is how we process. This is how we do it. Okay. Now I can, I can handle the next one and then I can handle the really uh, tough one. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that and give, give a little shout out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, exciting. Thank you. I mean, any other case studies that come to mind for you? Um, let's see. No, I, but I, not necessarily a case study, but I was curious, and, and you may have touched on this a little bit, but in terms of, is there a time, like, are there criteria that you would see a client come to you where maybe having this mix of grief and trauma, where it would be clear to you that grief work is not an appropriate next step? That's a good question. And I think we had talked about this offline where in our culture, people use the word trauma a lot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And clients will say to me, I felt traumatized or I feel trauma. Um, and I'm sure they it's interesting because i think the word trauma there's a dsm diagnosis and then it's a descriptor right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is it yeah it's a descriptor it's a description right and so people will say to me i felt traumatized by this or i feel trauma um they won't meet the dsm and even if as we were saying like maybe there's one or two of those real criteria, um, then they're still able to like really cope. Or, or one other thing I want to add is um, when I did the, so the prolonged grief training, which as you, I don't know if you know, but in my world, there's a lot of controversy over, um, I'm pointing to the DSM-5 uh, TR was just, you know about this, right? Um, about you, about the, uh, the new diagnosis. Yeah. I, I just know it's, I don't know extensively about it, but go ahead. So it's been very um, debated and people have very strong feelings about it. And so I did the level one training at Columbia for prolonged grief disorder. And I spoke with um, Jillian Bluford, who was our last uh, mm -hmm. host, a guest. I'm the host. She was the <laughs> guest. <laughs> um, and she spoke about it. So What's interesting is that it does look at this intersection of kind of trauma and grief, but it understands that, as I was saying, it's it's not a lot of what you're pinpointing for the DSM trauma. It's kind of what I was saying, how the person actually wasn't there. They read the report, someone explained it to them. So some of the, the techniques used are actually closer to exposure therapy mm. or narrative storytelling. And mm. those are a lot more of the elements that are used in that. She also says, oh yeah, Gestalt. I think mm. there's a Gestalt. Um, because uh, it's a 16 week um, prescriptive modality and you do these different different kinds of things. Um, some of them, some of the trainers are trained in EMDR, but not all of them. Did, did I, oh, so your question was, are there, <laughs> so have I ever had anyone um, come to me where I felt it was really trauma um, first and not grief? And to answer your question, those people I sent out for EMDR and they came back <laughs> and they felt it. So I guess the answer was, and maybe it's just the clients I'm getting, because I haven't had a client who saw someone be murdered in front mm -hmm. of them. I, mm -hmm. I, I haven't had that. Um, I've worked with many people, even when I was in hospice, who had loved ones die. Um but they hadn't witnessed it. So it, there just seems something different there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. what are your, mm -hmm. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. There is something different because it's um, in in trauma, it's this, I, I spoke about this before, but this whole snapshot in time, it's this moment, this um, of the, the sensations that were felt, the the five senses that were experienced in that moment that our brain remembers like in, in its files. Right. And so if uh, that was this moment of like um, threatened death or perceived threatened death, right. That is just uh, kind of stuck in our, in our um, 
memory bank. And it sounds like the clients that you're talking about that didn't have that moment, they didn't have that actual, um, uh, you know, they had already maybe heard the news um, and, and it wasn't this, this moment, this one moment in time um, that they, that they had all of those additional thoughts, feelings, and, you know, sensations that, that were attached to that. Yeah. And I mean, I want to share a client um, and I know we'll wrap up in like five minutes. Um, and it's this idea, like we talk about trauma, because I, I do think for these modalities to work, you understand kind of these very specific. Um, so I worked with a client, this was a while ago, this person had survived nine had so this was really sad I might get teary but she looked me in the eye and she said you know I walked down you know 60 flight of stairs to survive on 9-11 to only now you know 15 years later die of cancer that I got because she went back and worked there mm -hmm. she was dying of cancer that she, you know they're saying she got it from working there um, she had bo been born and raised in New York and had grown up. I mean, New York wasn't as safe in the seventies and, and she grew up in a neighborhood that, so her sister, I think in the seventies or eighties, someone came into her apartment and raped and strangled her sister, who was like 20 something at the time, devastated her, of course, her mother, um, her father, a couple of years later happened to be an innocent, innocent bystander. There was like a robbery at a deli or a corner store. And he happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time was shot and killed. Her mom, of course, was just like devastated. Um, mom, I think died kind of early, younger, not young, young, but like, you know, so this woman lost her mom, her dad, you know, her sister from this traumatic, her dad, mm -hmm from this shooting, um, mom died depressed and sad. And now this woman, I mean, it was just so, so, you know, I know we talk about trauma um, mm -hmm. and really a, such a hard, sad case, right? I'm like mm -hmm. upset talking about it. Um, and so this idea of like, certainly this is trauma, knowing your sister and, you know, um, and it's a loss lens. I use that a lot with my clients. Sometimes I'll just say, can we use a loss lens on this? You know, this, this kind of grief lens. Um, but again, she wasn't there when dad was, she was, certainly wasn't there with the sister, which is like terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think with her mom, it was just, you know, this kind of just sad, like, you know, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about like this word trauma, like, cause I do think this woman was traumatized, but what do you yeah what's your what do you yeah. Think? yeah I think that it is definitely this the case that you're talking about really a layered um trauma effect of like compound trauma really um and I think that to your point earlier I think it is true that society has kind of co-opted the word trauma and so it is important as we're talking to clients to really get clear, I mean, to really understand if they're using trauma, you know, to just be aware they may be using it in, you know, what that means for them. Um, but, but in terms of as a clinician, I'm going to be looking for, um, despite the word that they use to describe it, am I seeing these symptoms here and here and here um, to kind of understand because you're right it can be whereas you know the case you just talked about a hundred percent is you know definitely has experienced multiple traumatic events right but then in terms of when when you're working with a client it's what does how how is that event impacting your current functioning now right and kind of looking at those symptoms because also what's true is not everybody who experiences trauma will have PTSD, right? So it's kind of about understanding that not everyone who has experienced a traumatic event will have these continued symptoms in their lives um, going forward. So I love that. I think, and before we wrap up, you just said something really key. You said, how is it impacting their, what did you say? Their current functioning. Current functioning. I think that's really 
important. How is it affecting their current functioning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that's really, so I'm going to borrow that from you and maybe you, I'll give to you, I don't know if it's helpful, this lost lens, because sometimes I think clients, it can just be helpful to, I don't know, that's my term. Maybe you can come up with something, but sometimes people feel like naming it, like that is a, a Mm -hmm. I don't know, lost lens or this perspective kind of maybe with some of these clients might be um, uh, help them identify it. Yes, definitely. I'm going to gladly take that, that from you. And I love it. Um, what a great way to kind of bring that in and this acknowledgement of various losses um, in a client's uh, life. I, yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. For, you were so generous with your time. I really, really appreciate it. Oh my gosh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I just, I think the work you're doing and have done is just amazing. And I, I feel really grateful that I got to have this discussion with you. Well, I feel really grateful you've shared so much of this information. I think it's really important. Um, it's really helpful. And I think people like you in our culture, CBT, EMDR, you know, like this is really, um, we're, we're in a therapy speak culture, which can be good. Um, but I think it's important for people like you to be like, okay, let's kind of break this down and, and talk about it. Really important. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Please um, subscribe and keep listening um, to Thanatology Themes. And thank you so much, Ruth. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too.